Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm Molly Brunson, Associate Professor of Slavic Languages and Literatures and History of Art at Yale University. And today I'm welcoming you as Faculty Director of the Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies Program at the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. The Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies Program has sponsored this event today and the entire series of which it's a part. The series is called Visions of Ecology, and it's a year-long series on art and the environment in right. Eastern Europe and Eurasia. It's been co-organized by me, by Yelena Adasheva, PhD candidate in anthropology, and Barbara Bartunkova, PhD candidate in the history of art. My sincerest thanks really go to both of them for all of their hard work over this year on the series, as well as to Carly Koble for helping with all of the logistics today. Um, I'd ask that you please follow the link in the chat to subscribe to our mailing list to be notified of future events. So today we're delighted to have the fourth event in our series, and it's a talk presented to us by Dr. Victoria Donovan. The talk today is titled The Making and Unmaking of the Black Myth of Donbass, Art as Witness to Deindustrialization, Ecocide, and War in Ukraine, 2014 to 2023. Dr. Donovan is a senior lecturer in Russian and director of the Center for Russian, Soviet, Central, and East European Studies at the University of St. Andrews. Her current research focuses on the industrial history and heritage of the Ukrainian East, also known as Donbass, questions of heritage management and manipulation, and the role of the industrial past in forming community identities and politics. She is the co-author with Daria Tsimbaliuk of Limits of Collaboration, Art, Ethics, and Donbass, published in 2022, and co-editor with Irina Sklokina of Donbass Imaginaries, Heritage, Culture, and Community, a special collection published with Region, Regional Studies of Russia, East Europe, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia in 2021. Before she began her research in Ukraine, Dr. Donovan worked on Russian cultural nationalism and heritage politics in the historic Northwest of the country. Her monograph, Chronicles in Stone, Preservation, Patriotism and Identity in the Russian Northwest was published with Northern Illinois University Press in 2019. Dr. Donovan's current research engages with the public, civic and engaged humanities and her methodological writing in this area has been published in Modern Languages Open and is forthcoming in 2023 with Canadian Slavonic Papers. Her research and knowledge transfer work has been recognized with prestigious national prizes and grants, including an Arts and Humanities Leadership Fellowship, British Academy Rising Star Engagement Award, and an AHRC BBC New Generation Thinker Award. Dr. Donovan's new book is titled Monotown, Tales of Resistance from the Ukrainian East, and it will be published by Daunt Books Publishing in 2024. So one note on logistics, we invite all participants in the webinar today to add questions to the Q&A at any time throughout the presentation, and we'll move to a discussion period after Dr. Donovan's presentation. So with that said, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Dr. Donovan, for being here and for taking the time out of your day to have this discussion. So Victoria, without further ado, go ahead. Victoria, go ahead and unmute. Sorry, I'm just gonna share my screen and hopefully this will be fairly straightforward. Um, so, uh, Okay, can you see the um, slide now? Yes. Ah, oh, great, okay. Um, right, well, first off, uh, let me thank uh, Molly Brunson for her kind invitation to present in this excellent series. I've been following Molly's work on representations of industry and ecology in the Russian empire, including in the Donbass region of Ukraine for some time now. So I'm very excited to have the opportunity to discuss our intersecting interests here today. I also wanted to thank Carly, Elena and Barbara for their help in preparing and advertising this talk. Before beginning, I want to draw attention to the fact that this talk was prepared during a period of unprecedented industrial action in the university sector in the UK. 
I'll be talking about processes of neoliberal resourcification, uh, exploitation and extraction and their application to Eastern Ukraine today, but I invite you to think about how resourcification is also part of academic practice and how we might collectively mobilize to resist these processes. Practically speaking, 18 days of withholding labor over the past two months have meant that I was not fully able to polish this talk in perhaps the way I would have wanted to. However, I hope that you'll find it engaging, um, even if it is more conversational than it might have been if we hadn't been protesting against structural inequalities in our sector. So uh, I wanted to begin today with this uh, page from uh, a children's history guide uh, about the Donbass region produced in 1984. And it opens with the formulation, Shtotakoe Donbass. When researching Soviet literature about the Ukrainian East, um, you're, you will frequently encounter this phrase, Shtotakoe Donbass. Um, and it roughly translates as, what is the Donbass? What is Donbass, depending on if you prefer to use the article or not. If you were to translate it into Ukrainian, you would get Shtotakoe Donbass although you're much less likely to find this formulation, given that the fact that the thirst for defining the territory that would become known as Donbass, of, um, of capturing its um, historical, ge geological and economic essence was a colonial project, and as such was formulated in the colonial language of Russian rather than Ukrainian for the most part. I find this fo formulation, Shtotakoe Donbass, interesting since it expresses the desire to exhaustively define this region, which we find throughout its long history, and particularly since the discovery of coal there in the mid 18th century. This question also con continues to resound in the political landscape of the region today. The neo imperial Russian army that is today fighting brutally to claim ownership of the region is fighting in part for their own answer to the question, Shtotakoe Donbass. Um, they would answer this question categorically and erroneously saying that Donbass is part of the Russian world, the Ruski Mir, the imagined um, territory of cultural influence that extends to the boundaries of the Russian speaking territory. Ukrainians displaced from the region known as Donbass, who many of whom have um, had their lives fundamentally um, destroyed and, up, and um, uprooted as a result of Russia's war would obviously answer the question very dif differently. They might answer that the Ukrainian East is a region rich in biodiversity, a region with connections to European industrial history and heritage. Maybe they would answer that Donbass is, was the heart of activist Ukraine before its occupation. If we had to think for a minute about how we would answer the question, Shtotakoe Donbass, I wonder what images would come to mind. Perhaps some of the images that you see in the picture accompanying this page of text. Maybe it would be the smokestacks or the blast furnaces. Maybe it would be the head frames attached to the mines, or maybe it would be the concrete monotown architecture that is so characteristic of this part of Ukraine. I would wager, however, that images such as these would not immediately come to mind, although they are also an answer to the question, Shtotakoe Donbass. When we think of Ukrainian East, we often think of it through the lens of industry, deindustrialization, and war, and that's understandable. That's been a very obvious, dramatic part of the region's story in recent years. But there are other sides to Donbass too, ones that don't get visualized and don't get imagined as often uh, or as dramatically. But the mineral risk rich composition of the subsoil of the region means that as well as industrial extraction, this part of Ukraine is characterized by rich biodiversity. It's home to a, a, a range of rare forms of plant life you can find, for example, in places like the Klebam, uh, Klebambuik National Park um, photo, in the photograph on the left, uh, a range of rare flora and fauna, plant life such as steppe grasses, feather grass, campion, steppe tulips, veronica. You can also find here naturally occurring salt plains, um, which have lead to the calcification of trees, such as those you see in the picture on the right. These trees look today like sculptural monuments. And on the ground, we can see a rich carpet of soleros or samphire, also known as 
sea asparagus growing on the ground. It grows here in a variety of colors with a spectacular effect. These landscapes are entangled with the experience of industry, deindustrialization, and war. You might not have noticed when you first looked at it, but the picture on the left also contains a trace of the wartime experience of the region. The large divot running through the field there isn't naturally occurring. It's a trench that was, that was dug in 2014 when the Klebambuik Landscape Park became a strategic height in the battle to expel Russian-backed invaders from the territory. These parks are today at the center of Russia's brutal war against Ukraine, and all forms of um, human and more than human devastation are occurring as a result. If these are in part the answer to the question, then why do we think only of industrial extraction and ecological depletion when we think of the region? Well, I would say part of the answer to this question is bound up with what the environmental historian and um, the environmental scholar and art historian Asya Bazdirova has called the resourcification of Ukraine. When Asya Bazdirova talks about resourcification, she means a dual process. On the one hand, the actual process of agricultural and industrial exploitation and depletion that has resulted in the mineral beneath of territories such as the Ukrainian East being extracted and exploited for capitalistic profit. But she also means the crystallization of Ukraine generally in the geopolitical and cultural imaginary of the outside world as a resource, an extraction site, a transit space. As she writes in her article, No Milk, No Love in Eflux Journal this year, resourcification as a framework is productive in order to see how Ukraine's territory and its people are imagined as a component of material exchange. The notion of the territory as a resource justifies a spatial organization that enables slow violence and environmental damage through the category of the inhuman. This process equates the human population and life at large to geological, agricultural, and other forms of matter with usable material capacities. Bastyrova points out that this idea of resourcification has pertained in different forms across time and across different political regimes. As she continues, and here I quote, over time, the relations of power and property would change with monarchic rule being transformed into the promise of communism and then into oligarchy. But no matter the governing force, the attitude towards the territory and its people as an inexhaustible resource remained constant. Bazdiriova makes the argument uh, for Ukraine being the subject of resourcification as a whole. But I would suggest that the territory of eastern Ukraine, also known as Donbass, can be seen as a special case of resourcification. The Donbass region was re reduced to a resource not only in the colonial systems and imaginaries of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union, as well as later in the neoliberal West, uh, Western, by lib neoliberal Western corporations who looked to extract the region's resources for their own profit and gain, but it was also resource resourcified by Ukrainians within Ukraine. As the political historian Andriy Portnov points out, Donbass was constructed as Ukraine's constituent other a heavily industrialized region that was culturally deprived or it was imagined to be a culturally deprived, quote unquote, not Ukraine against which the real Ukraine was able to define itself. My talk today then is in two parts. In the first part, I want to discuss what I'm calling the making of the black myth of Donbass. That is the reduction of the region in the cultural imaginary to a simple extraction resource. And to quote Bazdirov again, the processes of slow violence and environmental damage that are enacted on the region through the category of the inhuman. In the second part of my talk, I want to talk about how contemporary forms of art activism in the Ukrainian East have resisted this process of resourcifying the region, unmaking the black myth. Here, I find it useful to think along with decolonial feminist critics such as the Chakassian Uzbek scholar Madina Tlostanova and the Ukrainian researcher Darya Tsimbalyuk, both, who, both of whom have written about the power of decolonial art practice to disrupt and de-link de from resourcifying ep epistemic practices and cognitive operations, asserting instead the possibility of quote-unquote 
thinking and doing differently. These are the words of the Argentine decolonial critic, Walter Mignola. Klostanova refers to this kind of active practice of delinking as a decolonial choice or option, something that she opposes to the passive state of post-colonialism. And on the slide, I've quoted her, um, her words from the article, The Postcolonial Condition, The Decolonial Option, in which she distinguishes between postcolonialism and decoloniality. Postcolonialism, she says, is a certain human existential situation which we have no power of choosing, and decoloniality is an option consciously chosen as political, ethical, and epistemic positionality and an entry point into agency. In the second part of my talk, then, I'll discuss four, interest in, four instances of art practice from the Ukrainian East that I understand as manifesting a decolonial choice delinking with these processes of resourcifying the region, of reducing it to just its extractivist potential, and rather um, exploring alternative worlds of possibility and meaning that are linked um, to this part of the Ukrainian territory. So part one, the making of the black myth. I want to discuss here how the industrial myth of Donbass came to be established and why industry uh, and deindustrialization and since 2014 war have remained the dominant cultural narrative of the region. When thinking about how Donbass became Donbass, because it wasn't always Donbass, and in fact Donbass is not a neutral territorial signifier, but rather a reference to a geological formation, the Donetsk Coal Basin, um, I think this map is a useful place to start. This map was authored by the Ukrainian geologist Yevgraf Kovalevsky, who was in fact one of the first, um, uh, first professionals to use the term Donbass to refer to this territory. Kovalevsky trained firstly in Ukraine and then later at the Mining Academy in um, the Gorny Institute, the Mining Institute in St. Petersburg, the center of colonial expertise around mining at that time, um, before returning to the region to carry out a stratigraphical survey of the mineral beneath that lay beneath the ground in this part of Ukraine. As a result of Kovalevsky's expeditions and his surveys of the land, he produced this map. And the map shows uh, the deposits of different geological eras that lie beneath the ground. I don't know if you can see my uh, cursor, but um, this long pink strip that kind of lies down the, uh, that follows the, the um, Sivisky Donetsk River here uh, refers to the Cretaceous era limestone and chalk that lies beneath the ground in this place. Here, the splash of yellow shows the Permian era gypsum, and the green, which occupies most of the territory, uh, refers to the formations from the Carboniferous period, the clay shale formations, and the coal that would become the focus of industrial extraction in the 19th century. This map, in a sense, is marks the transformation of the region that would come to be known as Donbass from a negligible periphery in the Russian colonial imagination into a viable extraction resource. And in many ways, its production and the publications that Kovalevsky uh, wrote accompanying it, in which he identified the exact location of certain types of coal, coking, anthracite, and lean, effectively was an invitation to industrial capitalists to come and start tearing up the region. And come they did. At the end of the 19th century, the Russian empire introduced a series of strategic fiscal reforms that made it more desirable for foreign capitalists to relocate their business to the empire. The result was an influx of foreign capital to all regions of the Russian empire, the shipyards of St. Petersburg, the metallurgy industries of the Caucasus. But with its unique potential for industrial extraction, Donbass became a site of particular interest. And as you can see from these postcard photographs, which were produced by foreign companies who relocated their business to uh, the Ukrainian East at this time, Belgians, Dutch, British and American industrialists all began to focus their business on extracting the mineral beneath of the region in order to generate head spinning amounts of profit that would benefit for the most part elites in the Russian empire, in the colonial center of the Russian empire, and elsewhere in other, um, uh, in other parts of the world. What's interesting about these postcard photo photographs is that they're some of the earliest 
articulations of the visual discourse of, industri of, of industry that would come to characterize this region and in fact exhaustively characterize it, um, uh, excluding any other kinds of imaginaries of the place. With the Bolshevik revolution in 1917, these foreign capitalists were displaced and their industries were nationalized. At the same time, the memory of foreign investment in the Ukrainian East and the development of the region was also buried and erased. Archives that attested to this history of foreign capitalist investment and development of the industries um, in this territory were sometimes removed completely as the Soviet state tried to historically erase this part of the story. And a new narrative was established in its place, which spoke about um, the Donbass being a Stalin era construction, a result of crash industrialization and um, the great leap forward in, in, the, uh, in the economy at this time. In order to support this new narrative, a whole world of propaganda was created to verify the story. And this is probably if, if people um, know anything about the sort of visual representation of the Donbass region, it's probably from this period in time when a number of worker hero cults, including the cult of Stakhanov and the Zotov were established, and with them a huge um, corpus of vis visual propaganda, including documentary film, photography, uh, literature, and other kinds of cultural products uh, that attested to this region as a kind of flagship of proletarian industrial modernity. At this time, Donbass uh, steel workers and miners became the poster boys and girls of Soviet industrial production, figures to be admired, emulated, and so in some cases even feared. And some of the associations with Donbass that pertained across the 20th century certainly date from this period of intensive cultural mythologization. But already by the 1970s, the economy was not thriving in the Ukrainian East, nor was it in other parts, industrial parts of um, the Soviet Union. Economic contraction under Brezhnev led to worsening conditions in the mines, leading to major strikes in the 1980s, which labor historians such as Louis Siegelbaum and others have shown contributed to the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Ukrainian historians Irina Sklokina and Volodymyr Kulikov have written about this being a moment when we see the emergence of another kind of mythologization of the Donbass region. This sort of mythologization was an inversion of the reverential celebratory tropes in Soviet propaganda, instead focusing and almost fetishizing um, the economic deprivation and the socioeconomic collapse that characterized life in many, um, of many, many um, towns in the Soviet in the in the Ukrainian East at this time. And it's at this time that we see a number of um, photographers from the region uh, creating works that would in their own way become part of the cultural mythologization of the Ukrainian East, um, which focused in particular on these um, conditions of domestic deprivation of um, difficult and challenging working conditions and of life living in the toxic orbit of industry. So these photographs that you see on your screen now are those of Alexander Chekmenyov, um, who created a series. Uh, she's a, a photographer from Luhansk and created a series of photographs of Donbass miners between 1994 and 2011. Viktor Marushenka, who was a very influential um, photographer from the region who inspired uh, a whole generation of um, kind of street photographers after him to, to create sort of non-canonical images of, of life in, in the region. Um, and this is from his series, Donbass Dreamland from 2003, 2004. And Valery uh, Milosertov, who um, created this series, Abandoned People in 1994 to 1999, which featured in particular women miners and was quite a striking and, and shocking depiction of, um, of the poverty of these communities. On the one hand, these anti-canonical images of the, of the region are themselves decolonial. They break with the Soviet aesthetic practices, which um, varnished reality and, um, and perpetuated this categorically positive celebratory uh, visual narrative of, of industry. Um, on the other hand, they demonstrate a, a movement towards um, a kind of self-exoticization, a fetishization of poverty that would become part of the, um, the new cultural mythology of the region in the post-Soviet period, as it became the kind of iconic region of Soviet, post-Soviet Jornokar. 
Um, and I think it's telling that, um, as I learned recently in a presentation by the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute um, MAPA project team, that um, many Ukrainians, I think up to 80% of Ukrainians hadn't visit, who did not come from the region, had never visited the East before 2014 and dismissed it as a bleak and depressing part of the country, which had nothing of cultural note and wasn't particularly worth spending the time to go to. Uh, and I think you know the, the the sort of visual mythologization of the of of the of the place at this time really contributed to that understanding. With the outbreak in war of two thousand and fourteen, the notion of Donbas as a bleak and miserable place were compounded uh, was compounded with all encompassing images of war. And of course, I'm not trying to make the argument here that this cultural mythology was wholly misrepresentative. Of course, economic deprivation, the rise in outmigration, particularly among younger generations, the industrialization, um, the collapse of urban infrastructure and the outbreak of military violence in the territory all did impact in really serious and dramatic ways. But what we see in the kind of cultural representations of, of the place at this time is a fetishization and exoticization of these conditions. Um, Donbass is depicted as a landscape of multiple apocalypses where nothing grows, where humanity can't thrive. It's a post-human landscape, a toxified warscape, somewhere no longer fit for habitation. And I think it's notable that films such as Valentin Vasyanovich's Atlantis and Serhi Lozritsa's Donbass were very poorly received in the region by people who thought that um, they were very um, kind of pejorative re uh, um, representations um, albeit fictional representations uh, of this region. Okay, so um, just to kind of sum up what I've just um, been saying, in line with Bazdirova's thinking, I see the parallel processes of geological prospecting, the actual physical extraction of the territory through um, processes of industrial production, and the territorial imagination of, of um, the Donbass region as this site of extraction, this resource, um, and this depleted resource as having contributed to the resourcification of the region, um, the reduction of Donbass in the cultural imaginary to a landscape of depleted life. In the second part of this talk, I want to think about how those who live um, in the region, who have situated knowledge of the multiple realities that exist beyond industry, and who do not look at Donbass with a dispassionate and critical distance of some of those who produced um, art and representations of it have offered alternative imaginings um, of this place, which are informed by an intimate embodied knowledge of its complicated present and how these imaginings break with the resourcifying epistemic practices and think and do differently, to use Mignolo's words again. In this section, I'm going to talk about four instances of our activism from the region, which I understand as manifesting a decolonial choice. And by that, as I've explained, I mean how they break with these dominant practices of understanding the region as, a, as, a, as an extraction resource, as a site of um, colonial exploitation. This section of the paper is based on long-term participant observation work that I carried out between 2019 and 2021, interviews that were carried out both before the escalation of the, full, of the war against Ukraine um, and after, and close analysis of art practice and the works themselves. So as we've seen, um, the first section I want to talk about, I've called From Ruin Porn to the Zabroshka Erotic. So as we've seen, contemporary outsider looking at the deindustrializing Donbass region has often taken the form of ruin porn, um, by which I mean, um, quoting Jamie Rann, who's written about this in the Calvert Journal, the reduction, aestheticization, and dehumanization of the landscape, which is rendered naked and inhuman, a in a parallel way in which to which uh, in a in a parallel way to which pornography objectifies the female body. I think um, I think ruin porn is an interesting um, kind of tendency to dwell on when thinking about how regions such as the deindustrializing Donbass region have been depicted, because it evokes the, the idea of pornography evokes this um, relationship of a distanced viewer looking from a place of privilege um, at an aestheticized kind of form of deprivation, 
which has nothing to do with the situation in which the viewer finds themselves. So it's this distanced, exploitative kind of looking that um, derives pleasure from um, a, de a, de a condition of deprivation. So by contrast to ruin porn, um, I developed together with Daria Tsimbaluk in an article that we published in the Ukrainian arts journal, Your Art, the idea of the Zabroshka erotic to describe how people who are from those deindustrializing places engage with those same ruins, but in a very different way that manifests different values of care, compassion, the desire for preservation, and the desire to create something new. Um, in 2019, Daria and I spent some time in Severodonetsk and Lysychansk, where we were carrying out a summer school together with local artists. And we had time to, um, to, to, spend, uh, to spend time and get to know some of the art activists who were working out of a local organization, the Art Residency Plus Minus. Um, the group of art activists who were um, present in Plus Minus in Severodonetsk uh, would take regular expeditions to abandoned industrial buildings in the region, such, such as, for example, the Tomaszewska uh, Pivdena mine that you can see in the photograph in the top left. Um, during these expeditions, they would explore the industrial sites, um, identifying objects that they thought were worthy of excavation and preservation and bringing them back to their community center in order to clean them up, repair them, and to work them into some kind of um, sort of upcycling project or new creative work. Um, and I think this sort of engagement with industrial ruins, which isn't the kind of distanced looking that um, I talked about in connection with ruin porn, but rather involves an embodied inhabitation of uh, derelict sites and a careful recovery of the objects that are contained within those sites, which have officially been discarded as historical trash, as one person put it in interview with us, um, constitutes a, a, a very different kind of um, different kind of practice, a practice that is, um, is embodied and is um, invested in the, uh, the care and, and preservation of, of these landscapes. So the objects on the right that you can see here are objects that were recovered from um, various industrial sites that were then incorporated into what the group called an archive of deindustrialization. And the intention um, with the creation of that archive was to ultimately create a digital record of industry from the region um, that preserved uh, many of these objects that were otherwise being abandoned to dereliction. The um, installation piece that you can see here, which was present in Severodonetsk, comprised a number of these objects which had been worked into, into a, a kind of a piece of contemporary art. But there were also many other instances of, um, of uh, recovered objects that had been upcycled into set decorations and other kinds of artistic works, giving them new leases of life and a new meaning for contemporary communities and new generations of residents. There were other forms of engagement with abandoned buildings that um, we were able to, um, um, to engage with while we were um, in the region in 2019 as well. This project, for example, which was curated by Vitali Matuchna, who was resident in Lysychansk, um, had the name Garalia Ni Atatryosh, uh, which roughly translates as um, a gallery that you can't rip down, although gallery is purposefully misspelled, giving a kind of indication of the extra institutional anti-canonical nature of the project. Um, this curatorial initiative, which was um, really gaining momentum before the full-scale invasion in February 2022, was um, a project to work with artists from the Donetsk and Luhansk regions to realize exhibitions of local creative work um, in derelict buildings across the region. So Vitali um, would put a call out to artists who would come to a derelict site, such as a factory warehouse or a hangar, and would install their own work on the walls, creating this panorama of local creativity. And it was quite an anarchic process. So the only rules of installing artwork in these spaces was that you weren't allowed to interfere with another person's artwork. And as such, you had quite a, a kind of uh, an anarchically um, coordinated set of, of works being installed, which interacted and entered into dialogue with each other in interesting ways. 
I interviewed Vitaly in the summer of 2022 after he'd been displaced from uh, Lysychansk to, Lv uh, to Lviv uh, when he was still working on the project, but at distance. And he told me that his intention with the project had been to showcase work by local artists as a means of resisting the objectification of the Eastern region by outsiders who often depicted it as a place of post-industrial exotica, aestheticized ruin porn or a charred warscape. As he explained, he wanted to cur curate exhibitions of work by people who knew intimately the reality of life in the Ukrainian East. I think that Vitaly's work in many ways corresponds with Klostanova's definition of the decolonial choice, um, in as much as it um, engages in delinking from resourcifying epistemic premises, uh, that is, it doesn't want to reproduce these exoticizing, objectifying representations of the region, but rather to foreground the work of people for whom this isn't a, a field work, uh, for whom the region isn't a field for academic or artistic research, but is home, is a lived reality. Also, I think that Vitali's choice to uh, install these exhibitions in derelict buildings, uh, which he considered to be the most appropriate form for, for the works rather than um, gallery spaces or formal exhibition spaces, speaks of his um, decolonial practice too, in as much as uh, the, the project does not strive to achieve external affirmation that it's good enough or adequately professional, but rather determines for itself its own ethical foundations, root, rules of practice, and acceptable forms of expression. In this way, opening, an up, opening up what Klostanova has called alternative world perceptions. So the second example of decolonial art as resistance to resourcification that I want to discuss today was produced as part of the Unarchiving Post-Industry Project. The Unarchiving Post-Industry Project was led by the Center for Urban History in Lviv in collaboration with uh, my own university, the University of St. Andrews, and, in, and was carried out in partnership with the Donetsk Local History Museum in Kramatorsk. Um, it was displaced to Kramatorsk after 2014 the Pakrovsk Local History Museum and the Mariupol Local History Museum. And we conducted the project between 2019 and 2021. Um, through this project, we, digi we digitized around 30,000 photo negatives and around 90 hours of archival film from vulnerable industrial heritage collections that were located at museums throughout the Ukrainian East. This project, I think, is incredibly valuable now since many of these museums have been destroyed, displaced or looted as a result of Russia's war against Ukraine. And all of the materials that we digitized through the project can be found on the website of the Center for Urban History today, which is an open access website. So you can search the urban media archive of that of that um, institution and find uh, the materials that we digitized from um, uh, Kramatorsk, Pakrovsk and Mariupol there. Um, so apart from creating a digital archive of industrial heritage collections, what we wanted to do in this project was to, um, to carry out a series of public engagement activities that would unarchive this history, that would bring it into the public domain and make it relevant for local communities and even create new, stimulate new thinking and creativity. Um, so in addition to the archiving work, we also... Um, uh, coordinated exhibitions of uh, industrial photography, which were um, displayed in, in towns in the East, home movie days where donors of the video materials presented their collections. And here in this photograph at the top, you can see one of the home movie days that took place um, in Lviv, where people from um, some of the uh, regions where we digitized resources came and presented their materials, contextualizing them for broader audiences, and also um, community workshops. What I want to talk about um, in this talk, however, are the artist summer schools that we carried out in the summer of 2021 in Pokrovsk, where we invited art practitioners, curators and researchers to engage with the, digi the digitized collections of industrial photography. And I want to focus on one of the, um, the artworks that was created at this summer school, uh, which had the title De Industria. It was created by Alexander Kuczynski, who's a digital artist from Severodonetsk. Um, Alexander worked uh, with the archival photography of Pavlo Kashkal, uh, a Mariupol um, photographer originally from Yanakova, who'd worked variously at Zdanov Local History Museum, um, Zdanov being the um, former name of Mariupol. 
um, and also at the regional newspaper Azov C. Dawn and later at the Azov Style Factory. Um, Kashkil's photographic archive, which you can find at the uh, through the Urban Media Archives um, uh, website, is a really um, striking depiction of industrial life in Soviet era Mariupol. So it shows um, industrial workers in their place of work, metallurgy workers, but also ceramics workers and brick and brick manufacturers. Um, but in addition to representations of uh, industrial professional life, it also shows people at, um, during, in, um, engaging in leisure pursuits and at rest. For example, the photograph on the right that you can see here shows um, um, people sailing on the Sea of Azov um, in front of the Azov style metallurgy works. Um, in Alexander Kuczynski's series, however, um, he engages these uh, archival photographs in, in an interesting way. I want to just draw attention for a moment to the title of the series. So he called this series De Industria, which puns on um, the Ukrainian De, uh, which in Russian would be De, so where, where is industry, but also evokes the idea of deindustrialization. And in his um, series, uh, Kuczynski worked with Kashkil's portraits of workers in industrial settings, um, and also these um, depictions of leisure pursuits, um, superimposing uh, textures from the urban environment, which effectively erased the industrial iconography of the images. And I think this is interesting in several respects. On the one hand, uh, it evokes this idea of deindustrialization, uh, which while erasing the infrastructure of industry, nevertheless leaves its shadow behind. Um, and by that, I mean the legacies of industry, the intangible legacies of industry that still continue to inform the culture of place even after industry has ended. But also, and I think this is what for me makes marks this work out as decolonial, um, it uh, evokes the kind of lived experience, the haptic perceptions of post-industrial spaces by using these textures that Kuczynski encountered in his day-to-day -day life um, in the Ukrainian East. So the textures that are used to block out the visions of industry in the background are taken from um, uh, sort of playgrounds and urban spaces uh, from garage walls and from pieces of graffiti. So this is um, taken from a from a concrete um, playground, which you can see the Ukrainian colors have been um, painted onto and then they've crackled. So these urban textures become part of the images, um, suggesting a familiarity, a kind of textual, uh, a textual um, knowledge of these spaces, which brings these, um, these standardized and standardizing Soviet era archival images to life. So I want to move on now to talk about a different kind of art practice as decolonial delinking. Um, and this is the eco-critical eco filmmaking of the Free Filmers Cinema Movement and NGO, which before the full-scale invasion of February 2022 was a Mariupol-based collaborative project making independent cinema, whose main focus was um, ecology, as well as the struggle for equality and freedom in the region. And I want to focus just on one of the filmmaker, uh, one of the filmmakers from this collective today. Although I'd encourage you to to go and look further into the archive of um, filmmaking by this collective, because many of the works are really incredibly interesting, and very poignant and powerful now that um, Mariupol has suffered this devastating siege and occupation. Um, so this, what I want to look at today, is the work of Zoya Lakhtionova. Who is um, a Mari who was a Mariupol-based filmmaker, um, and I think what's interesting about Lakhtionova's work is that she also um, challenges this notion of um, the Ukrainian East as a passive extraction resource. But in this case, she does this by foregrounding the multi-species subjectivities and entanglements that characterize local environments. So rather than seeing that these uh, the region as a, a site of depleted life as a site of devastated post-apocalyptic, post-human um, existence. Um, she really foregrounds the thriving life, the multi-species thriving that characterizes, um, that characterizes these places. And in this way, I think links with what Bazdirova talks about as, um, as, the, as resisting the category of the inhuman. 
So Lakhtyonova's Diorama, a film, a short film that she made in 2019, begins with a shot of a curious interspecies event that I also observed when I was carrying out fieldwork in Mariupol in 2021. In the image on the left, you can see fishermen are shot in thick fog, fishing off the coast of the Sea of Azov near the Azov-style metallurgy work. While the scene remains mysterious and unexplained for the outside viewer, its specifics would be easily recognizable to Mariupol audiences. This is the place where the cooling water from Metinvest's steelmaking processes flows into the sea, and as a consequence of the warmed water, fish are drawn to the shore in large numbers, and fishermen are able to profit and catch them um, uh, when this process happens. So the way that the fish are drawn by the man-made pollution here and caught by the off-work steel workers who then absorb their toxin bodies into their own is a strange kind of ecosystem that's specific to industrial, uh, to economically peripheral and industrialized places such as Mariupol. As this opening shot of Diorama, as, as, as the opening shot of the film Diorama, the scene communicates several ideas simultaneously. The inter it communicates the interspecies experience of ecological damage, the resourcefulness of human and more than human subjects living in damaged landscapes, and also the melancholic beauty of the scene as observed by one who knows and understands its meaning. In a later scene, which you can see here depicted on the right, Lakhtyonova provides a stationary shot of a beach where gentle waves lap at the shore and a row of mature poplar trees grow somewhat uncannily from the sand. A voice of an elderly woman from a recorded interview begins to reminisce. The sea is our fortune here in Mariupol, in Stanov. When I was a child, someone's mother would gather all the kids from the street and take us to the sea. We'd bathe and lie in the sun. They'd take our class to the sea to strengthen the shore. We'd plant poplar trees there. These poplars must be 50 years old now. End quote. The camera then pans to the tree's trunks, the barks of which are marked with arboglyphs or tree graffiti left by generations of Mariupol residents. This strangely beautiful canvas of interspecies relations where humans inscribe the landscape and landscape inscribes human memory is suddenly, is suddenly ruptured, however. Lakhtyonova, uh, as the narrator, um, begins to list the fish that have disappeared from the sea, the fish that used to fill a wash basin unwantedly in the past. This, the only thing that fills the Azov Sea now, she explains melancholically, is mines. The final scene in Lakjonova's diorama from which the film takes its name is a shot, is shot at the Mariupol Local History Museum in front of a diorama of the Azov Sea. The camera slowly pans the static scene of taxidermized animals, while an off-camera excursion guide speaks enthusiastically about the variety of bird and animal life in the area, ending her presentation with the words, and anyone taking a swim in the kind waters of the Azov Sea will always return there again and again. Following directly after an episode exploring the challenges of demining the Azov Sea, these words ring with a chilling hollowness and the di diorama suddenly takes on the qualities of a mausoleum. Breaking the frightening spell, Lakhtyonova walks forward from behind the camera to enter the shot of the diorama. The viewer sees her only from the back as she observes the staged scene. Thinking again of the activist intent of this film, we might see this as one more expression of the reality of interspecies entanglements that have traditionally been ignored in resourcifying narratives of industrial modernity. At the museum, Lakhtyonova asserts her subjectivity as a human agent observing the destruction of nature and places herself in the frame as part of the diorama, just one among a multitude of dying animals. So I wanted to end my talk today with one more project, which was produced following the full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. To return one final time to Bazdirova's argument about resourcification, I wanted to quote again from her article, No Milk, No Love. Bazdirova writes, the Russian war on Ukraine is part and parcel of the imperial and therefore colonial view of Ukraine as a resource a space for transactions, material exchange, and relations of extraction and depletion. And the problem, or even the tragedy given the circumstances, is that there are two colonial powers at play, one actively killing and the other exploiting to the very last and then leaving the people and land to die. 
As we know, this war has once more centered on the Ukrainian South and East, where more than human lives have been displaced and landscapes and ecologies have been annihilated. And Bazdirova is surely right. While there's been huge support in the West for arming Ukraine, there is also continued neoliberal extractivist interest in the territory as a resource, be it a geopolitical, economic or mineral resource to be controlled, extracted and exploited for capitalistic gain. Like the other art activist projects that I've discussed in this talk, the Mariupol Memory Park, which was produced by the same Free Filmers Collective, disrupts the, no disrupts the notion of the Ukrainian East as a passive transactional space, a site on which colonial and neo-colonial destruction and erasure can be enacted, and a place that has been abandoned to post-apocalyptic devastation and colonial domination. The website archives the activist life of the city before the escalation, it contains um, sections which include many beautiful and inspirational pieces of creative writing about Mariupol, also um, non-fiction writing and academic uh, short essays. It has a section on visual art about um, various aspects of life in Mariupol film and also uh, a very compelling section on audio story storytelling. And I'd recommend you to take a, a look around it if you don't know it already. Um, but by archiving this life, the makers of the site resist the erasure of Mariupol, explaining that while the territory itself has been lost, temporarily at least, the spirit and culture of re resistance that resided in the town has not. And quoting from their landing page, um, the producers write, our Mariupol values, our experience of openness, cultural reflection and struggle for equality have endured. The site is almost entirely made up of work by Mariupol-based creative practitioners whose connections to the city are cited in their short biographies at the top of the works contributed. The authors of these works are mostly Mariupol locals whose visions of the city are not the exoticizing imaginings of the distanced outsider, but are created through situated embodied knowledge. This knowledge informs, for example, the representations of the Illich Metallurgy Factory produced by Artem Bereznev, a former manager at the steelworks and photography enthusiast. These are very different imaginings of the factory to, say, the works of Dmitro Kozatsky, the fighter in the Azov Regiment, whose sublime images of the devastated factory and the mutilated Ukrainian fighters were picked up and circulated in the international media. Uh, Artem's images are rather domestic visions beautiful but banal, critical but affectionate. These are not images that are supposed to be resources for mass consumption. They don't extract from the place, but they're rather of the place. The final word in my talk, uh, sorry, I'd like to give the final word in my talk today to one of the key figures from the Free Filmers movement, the art and artist and filmmaker, Sashko Prochuk. As part of the Mariupol Memory Park project, Sashko produced an audio story about an encounter with a slag heap, which is called in Ukrainian a terikon, and in the Scottish dialect is called a bing, and he's used that word since we um, collaborated on the production of this, so he used the Scottish word in the, in the English language translation of the, of the story. This audio story parodically evokes many of the themes that I've been talking about today. That is the distanced imagining of industrial peripheries as otherworldly or unfathomably strange places, the exoticization of these landscapes, and by contrast, the embodied knowledge and experience of these places for those who live among them, for, for whom they are home. And in the last few minutes of my talk today, I just want to share with you the beginning of Sashko's story before welcoming further discussions and questions. And so I'm just going to stop sharing and then I'm going to swap to the um, to the audio and I'll just play the first three minutes and then I'll stop um, and open the floor for questions. Okay, so.
In September 2020, I went to the city of Toretsk to shoot a movie about memory. Around 30,000 people live in Toretsk. There used to be many mines and factories here. Now there is almost nowhere to work. What remains is memories and beings. Heaps of waste. Kostyan, a high school student, decided to show me the highest being. We went there on foot crossing the whole city. We bought a bottle of Zhivchik, a popular carbonated drink. The name translates as lively, so it was kind of no matter what, it will keep us alive. When we got to the Bing, it was already very hot. Vegetation only grew in isolated patches. Here and there, some trees were visible. Their shadows were much clearer than the trees themselves. The slopes of the Bing looked like landscape from another planet, or from our planet where something went wrong. I was surprised to see reeds sprouting all of a sudden under the totally bare dry slopes. I suspect it's because the mines have had a negative impact on groundwater. Among the reeds I came across an old Japanese phone. Kostyan found its handset somewhere nearby. In Soviet times such a phone was as valuable as gold. In about 20 minutes we got to the top. Kostyan asked me if it was okay to throw stones down into the chasm. He was wearing a cap with a pattern of weed leaves on it and talked a lot about how he hated school. So it was rather strange that he would ask my permission for such a thing. For a while we kicked stones along the road or threw them down the slope. <laughs> okay i'm gonna stop it there but thank you um for uh listening and i'd recommend uh going back to the mariupol memory park site and um and hearing the rest of that story if you have time and and taking a look around at the other artworks that are there um but thanks so much for your, your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Victoria. What an absolutely amazing and rich talk. And um, I, I especially wanted to thank you not only for all of the, the new work you introduced us to, but your work in uh, digitizing and preserving so many of these materials at the Center for Urban History. So I think we're all eager to go and, and, and explore these resources even further which actually gets to me to my first question, which is um, this, this concept of resourcification and uh, in particular sort of the different ways in which we can imagine resourcification. And I'm drawing here on an article that you recently published for Newsnet, the professional uh, publication of the Association for Slavic, East European and Eurasian Studies in which you write about this question from a disciplinary perspective. 
And I'd be curious to hear you speak a little bit about this further and more specifically this question that that many um, scholars working in, in sort of Slavic studies broadly construed are facing right now, which is uh, the sort of urgent demand brought on most recently by the war, but certainly not singularly, uh, to decolonize the profession uh, and to think about sort of systems of imperialism that have dominated our various disciplines for quite some time. And in this essay, you really urge scholars to stop and listen uh, to our colleagues in other places, right now, especially Ukraine, and to resist the call of the academic ego, to go in and in effect plunder um, the very resources of, again, a place like Ukraine, for example, for the sake of decolonizing one's own work. And so I was hoping you'd speak a little bit more about this, especially as somebody who's been working in the region in fact, long before uh, February 2022, uh, and, and really been putting in the, the sort of on-site, in-depth work uh, to further communication with colleagues and artists in Ukraine. So how do you see this particular moment uh, for uh, our various disciplines? Thank you for that question, Molly. That's a, a really kind invitation to talk about something that's really important to me. Um, so yeah, so I've been thinking about this this notion of resourcification in different contexts. And I've ex actually elaborated on that piece that I wrote um, for Newsnet in um, in an article forthcoming with the Canadian Slavonic Papers, which is exactly about this question of academic resourcification and resisting um, those temptations. So in that article, um, I start again with Bazdirova's no notion of resourcification, but then link it to um, another um, kind of uh, sort of uh, process of knowledge extraction that the Ukrainian cultural critic um, Sash uh, Sasha Dovzhik wrote about in a piece for CNN when she wrote about fixers in Ukraine. I don't know if, if you read that, but um, she wrote, she writes really uh, engaging me in that article about how she worked as a so-called fixer, so somebody who would help journalists to understand the local contexts that they wanted to write about, who basically had all of the kind of cultural goods that outsider um, writers and researchers needed in order to understand what they were looking at, but how fixers never get represented when the final article is produced, because, um, you know, there's this institutional um, kind of uh, uh, priority in pre presenting oneself as the ultimate authority, this kind of authoritative voice from nowhere um, that, that knows these things without having to ask anybody, which of course we know all know is a fiction. When we produce knowledge, we do so in collaboration always with so many people um, who are from the places and work in institutions from the places that we study, um, archivists, librarians, um, other scholars, activists, artists, all of these people are, are collaborating with us when we write our single authored monographs, although, you know, qu quite often we only represent them in the list of acknowledgements or in a small footnote at the end of it. So I suppose I'm advocating for a, a shift, like a paradigm shift in, in academia, I think, to, to be more transparent. And it's all well and good. I think it's it's very like kind of it can be interpreted as like virtue signaling to write these things. But then the actual practice of it is much more difficult, of course, because we all work in institutions that prioritize a single authored monograph and don't want to hear that we produced this all collaboratively and it wasn't us. It was somebody else who was who was there. So there's a there's a there's obviously a contradiction there that we are in order to kind of you know progress professionally we have to um, present ourselves as being these authorities but on the other hand there's this moral ethical imperative to to do collaboration in transparent ways and to benefit and to use our research to benefit those who, whom we work with often who kind of find themselves in less professionally privileged positions than we are so there's a dilemma there but I think you know and I started my talk with this kind of manifesto about our strike. I think we need to think about our work, particularly, you know, now when we're thinking about these questions of decolonization in the context of the institutions that we're working in and think about not only how colonization is ongoing elsewhere, but also how it's happening here right now and how we need to decolonize our institutions, not only in terms of, you know, kind of recovering histories that have been erased, but also really challenging these hierarchical 
patriarchal kind of structures of power that insist that we as kind of privileged Western academics, you know, are the ultimate sort of authorities on everything, which we're not. So I suppose that's how I'm understanding resourcification in the context of academic work, of not extracting knowledge from local communities um, in a way, or trying to challenge the structures that we work within that um, demand that we extract knowledge in that way. I mean, this is so interesting to hear, and I completely, um, you know, agree with what you're saying, and it's a really valuable point of view. I'm looking forward to the work in Canadian Slavonic papers. Um, maybe you could say a little bit more about the role that local institutions have played in this process for you, because I did take note of the fact that it was really important for you uh, in your field research to keep the archives local rather than extracting archives and bringing them back to the UK, for example, um, uh, or interpreting them solely from the UK, but having through sort of home movie viewings where you're really getting local perceptions. So could you say a little bit more about the importance of leaving the resources in local spaces, even to some extent now in this moment where some of these spaces are under extreme pressure um, and are being threatened and in fact destroyed, uh, is there a balance we can strike between keeping these, these archives and collections local, but also ensuring their preservation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so I think, you know, you can think about this in two ways. So you can think about it theoretically, and then you can think about the practical applications of it. So in that Newsnet article I write, I actually cite some um, um, scholars from, uh, who worked with black activist archives, who've really articulated the theory of not appropriating um, local resources really well. And I take lessons from that when thinking about what I, I think will be like a new wave of digitization initiatives because of what's going on in the region that we work in. The fact that we can't necessarily access the, the archives on site right now might mean that there is this sort of drive to digitize and then potentially to appropriate those resources and and hold them then in like these privileged institutions like our western universities that have lots of money and present themselves as kind of you know doing this work to the benefit of the local community but actually trying to benefit themselves by making these resources available to us and so in that writing about black activist collections um the researchers the archivists who i think were um um, at Princeton, I think it was a, a kind of a seminar series on, on um, archiving and the ethics of archiving at Princeton, um, talk about the fact that, you know, the, the digitize, archival digitization work needs to be done in a spirit of humility that is intended to benefit the communities who's, for whom these resources are most um, significant and relevant rather than benefiting the the researchers who want to work with them and so that actual that process of doing stuff that has sort of you know benefit on the one hand for a researcher because a, a university isn't going to fund something that just is like uh, categorically philanthropic well it might do but most of the time it won't um it needs to um so you know to, to do things that have benefit in different directions that can benefit us in terms of um, furthering knowledge and helping to carry out research, but also have direct benefit for the communities um, for whom these resources are most important. So for example, the project that I talked about, the Unarchiving Post-Industry project, which I presented very briefly in the talk today, that project obviously does, it created this digital archive, which we were, um, you know, convinced of course had to remain in Ukraine um, with the Center for Urban History, which is, you know, an inspirational institution um, which has worked long term in, in kind of archiving and public engagement around uh, um, archiving projects. So that was its natural home. But also, you know, Lviv isn't Eastern Ukraine either. Lviv is Western Ukraine and it has particular associations and, and is perceived in particular ways too. So they were very conscious of not appropriating these resources from communities in the East for whom, you know, they were in some cases family archives, um, you know, family collections, things that had a very personal, intimate meaning. Um, so the, the sort of the, the extra um, the additional work that we did around outside of the of the digitization was really intended to ensure that the the people who were donating these materials and the museums and the professionals who were involved in it were very invested from the very start in in the project and articulated um, for themselves you know what 
they wanted to happen with these kinds of sources. And so the actual kind of involvement of local communities in contextualizing these resources through the home movie days, through involvement in public talks, and later um, online through social media, um, strands to the project where you know the sources were further contextualized in local forums and that sort of thing were really important fundamental parts to that work in as much as it created um, it ensured that they remained within the communities and had relevance to the communities and the communities didn't feel um, disenfranchised from the project um, so that's I mean in your introduction you mentioned that a part of my work is the public at civic and engaged humanities and that's what I mean by that that you know the academic work that we have to do I think should be accompanied by this sort of community engagement work that ensures that we're not just extracting from communities and benefiting ourselves through our publications and our our projects but also doing work that additionally um, ensures that you know we're working ethically with the communities that we study and I'm sorry I've, I've talked a lot but I just want to say that again this is a an institutional question because often that work isn't valued in the same way as the academic work um so there needs to be an institutional shift there where that work is understood as a fundamental part of the academic process um and not just social work that we do on the side right mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um I'm curious hearing you talk about the digitization projects in particular, about the relationship that you're seeing uh, in your subjects and the artists that you're working with, the institutions you're working with between digitized artworks or, di or digitizable artworks, maybe I'll put it that way, and a kind of intensely material creative process. And there does seem to be, or at least in the works that you presented today, something of a kind of inherent tension there that you see a lot of sort of reclamation or or how you described it, a kind of upcycling of industrial um, sort of supposed ruins or objects um, from the terrain where you get these sort of amazing assemblages or sculptures or installations. Uh, but then on the other hand, we get films, we get um, digital storytelling, uh, we get art objects that can very easily exist in a digital sphere primarily and not in fact even have a material instantiation, which again would seem to be almost um, a situation of necessity at the very moment where material objects are indeed so precarious in some of the regions that you're looking at. And so I'm curious if you've noticed um, these kinds of discussions happening among artists in Eastern Ukraine or from Eastern Ukraine, a kind of consideration, in other words, of the, the sort of ephemerality of material objects in, in maybe especially this particular moment? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, inevitably, because most of the artists that I've been talking about today have been displaced from the regions that they work in, there's, there's kind of a, an inevitable... Um, movement away from this embodied practice which involves sort of long-term being in the landscapes in reaction to which the art is being made um and in its place one thing that i've noticed um and i've been um thinking about and i've i've written about um for a short chapter recently that will be coming out in a collection on art and objects in the context of the war um, that Natasha Klimenko is putting together, the Prisma um, uh, group in, in Germany, um, is this sort of movement towards digitization um, and digitization, like digital archiving as a response to cultural erasure and precarity. So I think, um, you know, the Mariupol Memory Park project, I write about that in that article because I think that that sort of drive, the archival drive, is a direct response to this um, this condition of hyper precarity um, when you know these these kind of places that um, are the sort of the origins of the artwork being produced are now no longer accessible, or these objects that have been um, kind of for a long time collected, preserved, upcycled, um, reclaimed, as you say, uh, are now even more precarious than they were before. And you know, the, the also I think one thing that is, is important to think about, because I've been talking a lot about industrial heritage, is you know, the, the value of that heritage has um decreased even more than it was previously. So 
previously industrial heritage was a precarious category because you know on the one hand it's not sort of valued culturally in the same way as kind of architectural or religious heritage but on, and then you know following the decommunization and desovietization laws it was um further devalued because it was associated with those problematic legacies but now with um, many of the kind of cities in the ukrainian east being so you know systematically destroyed there's no chance that these kind of industrial heritage objects will be rebuilt or that you know zaborovsky will be you know reclaimed and and um, celebrated as you know these important cultural sites of this region that's that's not going to be part of the conversation so with that in mind the fact that you know this this heritage is is you know potentially erased permanently and that there will be no drive to to kind of preserve it in the future the digital archiving of it becomes even more important so you know the the kinds of projects like Mariupol Memory Park, which digitally preserve that archive, which will no longer exist in the future. I think have you know the the importance of them has been recognised by by local practitioners. So people like Vitali Matukna have also been working very hard to sort of digitise all of the um, Zabroshki sites and the art heritage, the the art practice that he was engaging with as part of the Garilea project. And then again, I think also a part of the same sort of uh kind of tendency is the the grassroots kind of digitization work that is now going on in the Ukrainian East so a lot of 3D digitization projects that are just popping up and are then being kind of curated by um, official institutions into sort of more official archives within the Ministry of Culture in Ukraine these are all parts of the same um the same sort of uh kind of drive to to digitally preserve what will no longer be physically preserved in the future. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question here from the audience, which I'll, I'll read out to you. Um, I have a very basic question about audiences and generational dynamics. I got the sense from looking at free filmers myself that there is a sense of a young Ukrainian generation excavating a history that is different from the one that had been ingrained by Soviet propaganda in their parents. It's, it's related to what you were just talking about in a sense. Um, did you observe any generational dynamics at play in your work with local communities? Uh, and here's a second part of the question. I'm also wondering about the impact of displacement on these artists. I imagine most of them have left the region and gone either to Western Ukraine or abroad. How has that impacted the work in terms of practices and audiences? And has it led to more comparative projects, looking at similarities between the Donbass and similarly resourcified regions of other empires, for example, the French coal mining North, Wales, West Virginia, and so on? Yeah, thank you. Those are great questions. Um, who was that who asked that question? Masha Spol Spolberg. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah, I think um, those are those are really interesting questions. So there there are generational dynamics. Um, so I think you know the majority of the free filmers collective are sort of um, I would say people in their twenties to late thirties. Mm -hmm. um, so and there is that 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 generation of art activists some of whom were displaced from occupied parts of the Donbass region after 2014. So who moved to places like Mariupol from Donetsk. Um, so two very sort of prominent members of that movement moved from Donetsk because they were no longer able to, to live in, and, um, and work in that region after it was occupied. Um, those, th that generation, which is sort of slightly older than the kind of like the youngest sort of generation of activists in the region have been, I think, you know, have sort of um, intentionally uh, kind of uh, situated themselves as mentors often. So working with a younger generation of emerging activists in the region to instill values of kind of um, political engagement, kind of artistic engagement, which on the one hand involves kind of making art, which is, Kind of socially responsible and thinking about the most important questions uh, for you as a as an artist and making sort of artwork in response to that but also um you know very basic kind of training in how to be an effective 
political lobbyist in your community, for example. So the, the Free Filmers and uh, Platforma Chu, another organization based in Mariupol, they would work with young people to, to help them design a really good protest poster, for example, that they could then kind of protest with outside of um, local municipal authorities' buildings and, and demand change with a poster that would go viral online. That was like a big thing that, to allow you to get the social media momentum in order to kind of actually, you know, enact a change in your, in your community. Um, so there's that sort of generational dynamic, which is that the free filmers sort of have that relationship with the very youngest generation. So teenagers working with teenagers to help kind of, um, or that they were working with teenagers to help sort of um, just form that new generation of of art activists who could change their society. Obviously, you know, those that community has all been displaced now, so that work um, feels to some of them. I remember talking to Sashko Prochuk, and he was saying that you know that work feels like a failure now because they've they've been displaced, and that that generation will never come of age and be able to change things in Mariupol as they hoped it hoped they would. Um, but I don't think, you know, older generations are necessarily excluded completely. So one of the um, things about the free filmers um, filmmaking and um, art activist work is that it, it really um, seriously engages working class communities and other kinds of marginalized communities. So a lot of the people who feature in the films and they, they are quite collaborative themselves in the way that they make film. So often, you know, they'll kind of work long term with the, the people who, um, who, who feature in the films and allow them kind of a say over how, the, how their story is presented and sometimes integrate artwork that is produced by the people themselves who they show on camera. So there isn't this obvious kind of subject object dichotomy, um, this kind of viewing from a distance. They're very kind of I think they are like self-consciously decolonial in that way but that they don't want to kind of reconstruct this distance kind of critical gaze from nowhere and rather have this kind of reciprocal process in their filmmaking, which allows it to be more collaborative and ethical. And so they often work with um, working class communities who include older people um, from from the from the local community. So I, I think, for example, in uh, um, the life outside the CV, there's a really touching kind of vignette of a, an older father and his daughter um, and their relationship and and how they how they kind of um, the conversations and and what they get up to in Mariupol. So it's not just that young people feature in the film. There is a kind of active engagement with working class older communities as well. And as for the second question about displacement and comparative projects, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, so so yeah, the the um, Mariupol Memory Park project was kind of a comparative project because. Um, so we sort of collaborated with the free filmers, um, the project that I work on, which is about um, sort of industrial history and heritage and Donbass and art making, um, but also has a, a kind of um, an interest in post-industrial regions of the UK. So Wales, which you mentioned, which is where I'm from, and also the northeast of England and parts of Scotland, which have industrial heritage. We integrated um, the free film as materials into workshops that we did in, in the UK, thinking about these questions of um, how you can engage industrial history and heritage and kind of respond to it creatively and trying really to stimulate some similar thinking in the UK context, where obviously it's not comparable, but different kinds of cultural erasure have taken place, the erasure of working class cultures, for example, and how they've been overwritten by um, sort of new neoliberal identities in the post-industrial period. So, and they were really into that, like this kind of comparative thinking about post-industrial places. So I think there is a really, a really like sort of strong interest in doing more comparative projects. Um, but I mean, on the other hand, some of the stuff that was being done even before the escalation was comparative. So Lviv, um, the project that we did on archiving post-industry also had a, a, um, a, set, a, a strand which was about post-industrial Lviv. So um, there was this kind of, that, that's also, I think, an ideological choice not to just focus on the specificity of Donbass because, you know, it's so often constructed in those terms that this is a very unique uh, situation that couldn't happen anywhere else. Um, but that's not true at all. You know, there are, there are very strong parallels with other deindustrializing regions that, have undergone similarly kind of um, challenging circumstances, albeit not kind of full-scale war in the way that Donbass is experiencing it right now. Mm -hmm. 
Um, thank you so much for for answering these questions. I suppose I have one. We have time for one more question, and and I'll ask one which which is sort of hovering there in the background of much of what you're saying. But I'd be be curious to hear you um, address it more specifically. And that is, what do your artists that you've worked with the archivists that you've worked with, what do you yourself think about this question of what the Donbass is in a future oriented um, sense? In other words, what will Donbass become? Are, is this a question that is being asked among the artists that you're working with? Uh, or is this sense of a kind of future Donbass itself so deeply precarious in this moment that it's, it's not necessarily one front of mind? Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um... So, I, I mean, I didn't really get a chance to sort of elaborate on it fully in the talk, but I, I wanted to just kind of highlight again that Donbass is, is a problematic term. It's not a neutral signifier. So a lot of decolonial Ukrainian scholars would really reject that term, um, in part because of this whole kind of discourse of resourcification. The idea of Donbass, in as much as it's like this portmanteau word, which is... As a basic. Yeah, <laughs> it refers specifically to the, the kind of geological industrial identity of this place, binding it, sort of fusing it with this notion of industrial extraction. You know, lots of people find that problematic uh, and for good reason. And so, um, you know, a, a good number of, of people, including kind of artists who I work with, reject that term outright and would prefer to talk about kind of Donetschina, Luhanschina, these, mm -hmm. these kind of broader, less kind of politically charged categories, although there's potential for those categories to become politically charged too. Also the fact that, um, you know, the, the, um, the Russian back uh, separatist fighting forces really very um, enthusiastically adopted the term Donbass in a lot of their parlance then toxified that, that term um, for many people. So it, it has different resonances for different for different communities. On the other hand, some people, you know, and this is why I would use Donbass. <laughs> some people ask why I don't use the article. And I was it was recently corrected in a journal article uh, that I was writing and I was told that it should be the Donbass because it's it's this re it's this geological term. But I think, you know, by dropping the article, it somehow unhooks it from perhaps that sort of historic association with industrial extraction because for lots of people it has other associations emotional hues and it's not necessarily this obvious connection with um you know the colonial exploitation of the region and then that the kind of continuation of that exploitation throughout the soviet period um and you know actually Irina Sklokina who I wrote that um the introduction to the the um, special collection with she actually did a, a radio phone in where people from all over Ukraine Kind of phoned in and told and and spoke about their kind of feelings about that term, and there were a very different range of responses to it. Anyway, that's a long kind of way of saying that maybe you know, like Donbass as such has no future because maybe it doesn't exist or never did exist, and it was just a a cultural construct. I mean, if you're talking about the actual territories, and of course, you know, we all hope that they'll be recovered and and that the occupying forces will be expelled and that there will be a possibility for um, you know, people to, to return. And there's obviously a very strong kind of desire to return to those places where um, you know, one's family is from and those landscapes that are familiar and you know, that are also so much work had already been done. You know, so many kind of artists and activists found the Mariupol communities, including the free filmers, and it's so inspirational in terms of how um, they were articulating their thinking on on kind of topics of kind of ecological extraction, decolonial um, kind of resistance, and that sort of thing. Uh, I think you know there's a really sort of strong desire to reconstitute those communities, which are now displaced across Ukraine. Um, yeah, so I suppose the digitization work is all the more important for that reason, um, in order to to rebuild after the Ukrainian victory, hoping that that comes quickly. That's as good a point as any to end on. Thank you so much, Dr. Victoria Donovan. It really was an immense pleasure. Uh, your work is amazing and inspirational, and I know that we've all learned a lot. So thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who attended the webinar today, and we'll see you at the next one. Thank you. Bye.